This is, of course, the um, first event of the season for the N MIT Club of Northern California Energy and Clean Tech Series. And it's practically a sellout, and that's fantastic. So we're really excited about um, the turnout tonight. Um, as always, I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful facility, Park. Um, I want to introduce a couple people. Um, first of all, the CEO of Park is here, Steve Hoover. Steve, you want to go? And our usual host is Scott uh, Elrod, but Scott couldn't make it tonight, but he had uh, uh, Mark Stevenson stand in for him. So Mark, would you like to raise your hand? There you are, right next to Steve. <clears throat> it's really great, actually, that um, Park opens its facilities up to organizations like this and makes them available so we can put on events like this. So we really thank them very, very much. OK, so first of all, um, I want to do a little bit of polling. Um, how many people here in the audience are not MIT alumni? Raise your hand. Wait, not MIT? Come on, really? No kidding. Are you serious? I am blown away. Really, I thought it would be a lot fewer than that. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, <laughs> and you made a mistake, Steve. <laughs> anyway, no, this is great. We, we really, we've wanted this whole thing to be open to everyone, not just MIT alums. And, uh, <clears throat> and so it's really gratifying to see so many of you. But I am going to uh, ask for you to bear with me for a few minutes, because I'm going to do a few things that are all a little bit more specific MIT right now. Um, first of all, how many MIT 10, that is, graduates in the last 10 years are in the audience. Raise your hands high. OK, great. We are so glad you came. And what I'd like to ask you, because uh, we're trying to attract a younger audience, uh, in, addition, <laughs> in, in addition to the old folks like me, and uh, we want to know, did our special $20 pricing change your mind? <laughs> yeah. So that, that's what we were doing to try to attract you, to get you in, involved more in the program and everything. And then we'll figure out later on how to charge you more. But OK, <laughs> great. Um, so I went back to MIT last week for some various meetings. Uh, Alumni Leadership Conference was one, um, and another one uh, involving uh, development. And um, <clears throat> they put the inauguration of Raphael Reif right in the middle of it. Now, you saw the video playing there while it came out. So in a way, um, my thunder is a bit stolen. But um, it turns out that I was sitting in the second seat in the second row right next to a guy with a, an uh, iPhone. And um, he took pictures of the uh, inauguration. And we kept a few and edited them. I'm going to just show them to you and make a, a little commentary, because I imagine most of you weren't there. And, but it was a very moving ceremony. And it wasn't just all serious. There was a lot of humor as well, which I'll show you. And I think it kind of typifies H or MIT in quite a way. So um, oh, I want to also mention, too, that the, um, it was inspiring also in the fact that, and I apologize to those of you who went to other schools, that MIT was um, rated as the number one um, university in the world by um, the uh, QS World University ranking. So yeah. <laughs> And at the same time, US News and World Report ranked MIT the number one engineering school in the country. OK, so OK. That's not bad either. <laughs> so, so I think many of us are very proud of our institution. It's done a lot of really great things. And uh, it's pioneered a number of great things, one of them being the energy minor, which is still, as far as I know, the only course or only minor that's offered in any major university around energy itself. And it's a very versatile um, curriculum that allows the students to get much more into the practical aspects of, of um, the technology and where they might apply it. So it's a really, really exciting thing. And, and now they're doing the same thing with online education with this platform they call MITx and the partnership with Harvard called edX. We won't talk about that tonight, but I think we'll probably be talking about it later this year, because it's pretty exciting what they have in mind. So anyway, I thought that 
those of you who couldn't have been at the inauguration might at least appreciate seeing some of the photo highlights. So, of course, we had the band, you know, the concert-like band, you know, with the horns and things like that. And remember, this is an iPhone, and that's an iPhone 3, so these aren't great. <laughs> this, this is hard to see, but this, Rafael Reif is Venezuelan. And um, he was, um, he actually came to this country, I think, like by 35, 40 years ago. Um, with his uh, immigrant parents, but they were they were impoverished, and they came to the United States, and they made a great life. And so, in addition to the concert band, we saw this was a drum band from Venezuela, and they actually played these drums. You can't see the costumes very well; they're very brightly colored. Um, for about ten minutes or so, while the faculty was coming in, so it was pretty exciting. And the night before, they had actually had a um, all brass band of ten brass players playing all kinds of South American music. It was fantastic. So a little bit of color there. Here's the color guard, of course. They got to come in, you know, and you do the, the national anthem with those guys. But then you hear the guys in all the colors. And these were not faculty, but these were people from all these other universities and colleges, including from Europe and so on, that came to witness the inauguration. So it's kind of cool. And here's the. I don't know who these guys are, but I think they're the heavies of the ceremony. So <laughs> there they are. And they've got this big brass thing that looks like a scepter there. I have no idea what you do with that, but, but there it is. And here is, here is Raphael himself, the 17th president. Now, this is classic, because that's Drew Faust, and she's the president of Harvard University. And for those of you kind of know, is that every year, MIT pulls some kind of prank on Harvard. Many of the pranks involved, um, like when I was an undergrad, they, they um, soldered a slide rule in his hand. Remember one of those things? Like in his hand, because his hand is kind of reaching out in a gesture of supplication. And John, I'm sorry, John Harvard. What did I say? Oh, oh, it's John Harvard. Yeah, so <laughs> he's the symbol of Harvard University. So, so anyway, so, so what this picture is, and it's hard to tell, is that it's the statue of John Harvard with every bit of MIT paraphernalia you could ever find put on it. And then she took a photograph of that and then presented it to uh, Raphael Reif. So I thought that was pretty funny and pretty, pretty exceptional from, from her. Now, this is a classic, too. This is a rumba band. And, and there's a professor at MIT who has won the Pulitzer Prize in both writing and composing. And, and he composed this rumba for Raphael Reif. And they, they played it and sang it. You can see the two singers on the left. And it was hilarious. I just, I've never seen anything like that in what's supposed to be a solemn ceremony. But now it got solemn. The three people on the right are the past presidents of MIT, including Susan Hockfield, the most recent one. And uh, the gentleman on the left is John Reed, who's the chairman of the MIT Corporation, kind of like chairman of the board. And here he is reading the investiture to Raphael. And here's Raphael, who's accepting the investiture. But right after John finished doing this, the crowd broke into applause. They stood up, you know, and gave him a standing O and all that. And, and it all quieted down. And, and Raphael said, well, I haven't accepted yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but he did. And then he talked to us about his five initiatives, which I will not go into. Anyway, so that's it. Hope you enjoyed a little bit of color there from the Institute. And uh, excuse the quality of the photographs. Next time, buy an iPhone 5 and bring it to me. <laughs> OK, so on to tonight's uh, performance. So um, um, the future of US solar photovoltaic technology, I think, is a very interesting subject. Because there's a lot of people you know, that really question whether we can really do it or not. And um, Professor Bonacisi has done a lot of work in this area, and I hope that he's going to be able to convince you that we got a shot. Um, solar's been in the news a lot lately, running from negative things like the demise of Solyndra right here in our backyard, and how the Chinese might be destroying the global cell and module business through what some people call predatory pricing. Other people call it aggressive pricing. Um, on the positive side, if you were at our event in June of 2011, um, utility class solar installations are being brought up in the Southwest, including Southern California. And um, 
They've been in the news recently, so things are happening there. Um, and um, there's a surging business in rooftop solar, both for residential as well as commercial, especially in California, um, because of the low prices. So, um, and we're gonna have a, an event on rooftop solar uh, early in uh, 2013. Just haven't decided when we're gonna do it yet, who the participants are. But the neat thing about all of this is, is that California is in the middle of all this. And your presence here today is kind of testimony to the fact that solar is not only not a dying subject, but one of great interest to the people in this state and elsewhere. So um, Professor Bonacisi, or Tonio as I know him, um, is at the heart of MIT's research and teaching programs in solar photovoltaics. Um, he established a photovoltaic lab, which he may say a few words about, and also um, has co-developed a comprehensive course in photovoltaics, which is a lot more than IV curves, which is what I got when I went through. Um, this is a lot of physics and a lot of other very deep technology to teach the students what's really going on so that they can understand it well enough to really look for ways to innovate. But most of all, his own innovative research, much of which he'll describe to you, has led him to believe that the market, notwithstanding the coming bumps in the road and the past bumps in the road, will continue to be vibrant and growing um, industry for decades to come. So I've known him for several years. Shortly after he came to MIT, he needed a financial boost to get going. And I, along with others, helped him out. And I'm really glad that we were able to do that. It's probably the best investment I've ever made because um, solar research and education is now a very big activity at the Institute. And at the time, it was pretty small. In fact, very small, I think, if I remember correctly. So, um, and I know that although Tonio will tell you it's all about his students, one of whom is here, Riley, and you can just raise your hand, Riley, and a few others in the audience, special guests and everything of Tonio, you know, raise your hands, show your presence. All right, don't do it, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> And so, um, but I know that in fact, he's worked tirelessly for all this to happen over the last several years, so much so that he's almost impossible to get a hold of now. Uh, but we were able to do it, connect, and to make this event happen. So lately, though, he's had to kind of slow his work schedule down just a little bit to make room for this person, his daughter, who's now seven months old, and who's already showing signs of being a force in science and technology. <laughs> So let's welcome MIT professor Tonio Bonacisi to the podium to address the future of US solar photovoltaic technology. And we'll leave that up. We'll switch over. Thanks. Hope this works. Thank you, Doug. And uh, that was uh, my little one there. I believe she was deriving the Lorentz transforms. She was uh, on her way of deriving the foundation of, of uh, relativity. Um, once in a while, she brings me home a special present from daycare. Uh, and uh, this time, uh, I was in the hospital with 103.5 degree fever over the weekend. Um, I am uh, mostly recovered. I am not contagious, but uh, still a little bit uh, weak, not my normal effusive self. So apologies if I'm a little bit low key. It's not lack of excitement about the uh, topic. It's uh, uh, simply my body struggling to keep up with my mind. Um, the future of US solar PV technology. Uh, this talk is driven by the group. Uh, these are, uh, this is a subset of, of folks within the group. A uh, few folks are, are no longer with us. Uh, Hyun Ju, for instance, is now a professor. Um, others are, are graduating, and a few new people have joined. Um, to put this in perspective, um, these are the individuals currently within the group. Um, those of you from Park might recognize Stephanie Scott. She was here over the summer working with you guys. Um, we do work with crystalline silicon and with uh, thin film materials uh, to cover uh, all of our bases within photovoltaics. Uh, we have a number of collaborations with industrial partners as well. Uh, those that have not yet been uh, publicly announced are kind of listed under this uh, several unnamed industrial partners category. Um, those that have been publicly announced are listed here. So you can really see it's a group effort. Uh, it's not just myself, but it's my pleasure to represent the team in uh, presenting some interesting uh, tidbits and perspectives uh, of uh, the past uh, year or so in solar. So um, let's take a quick little journey right now into uh, the past year. And 
uh, see for ourselves some examples of, of headlines, right? So this is from a few days ago, uh, solar shakeout, the end uh, arrived for two more startup companies, okay? Uh, wait a second, solar is a hot investment for Buffett and Google. Um, okay, that was from March, not so long ago. Wait, is solar a bad investment? Um, okay, I'm really getting confused now. Should solar and wind power be subsidized? A lot going on, a lot of confusing, conflicting messages, and what I uh, have done for you tonight is to provide a few uh, perspectives of my own uh, to try to sort through these conflicting messages and to try to derive some meaning, some understanding of where this is all headed, uh, and it will comprise essentially five different parts. So the first perspective is that we need to lower PV's sustainable selling price to be, to be grid competitive without subsidies. What this, this is a very rich sentence with a lot of uh, subcomponents. Um, sustainable selling price. You hear in the news sometimes about, oh, uh, solar modules are now 60 cents per watt or, or 55 cents per watt. These are not uh, primary uh, points of sale. These are modules that are essentially uh, sold to one customer, perhaps left to accumulate, uh, and then uh, the, that customer tries to get rid of them uh, and, and sells them for a much lower price. So we hear about this 60 cents, maybe 65 cents per watt, as being a very, very low number, um, really compressing margins. That's not the bulk of solar modules out there today. Um, Long-term contract pricing, uh, still somewhere around a dollar, maybe a little lower, but um, you're looking at uh, uh, pricing uh, in various tiers, depending on who is selling, how much they're selling, how long the contract is, whether it's spot or whether it's long-term pricing. What I'm talking about here is sustainable selling price. This means you can build a business around it. This means that the business will last. It's not going to be uh, up for a year uh, and then fail. It's not going to be producing at a minimum margin, um, not able to expand. This is a healthy business that's able to perform R&D, uh, pay back its uh, loans to the bank, and uh, continue expanding. Uh, so to understand all of that, uh, I decided to introduce a technical talk with a little bit of economics. So let's do that. Uh, we'll break down an income statement from a company. These are, for example, quarterly reports. If you get a, an income statement uh, at the end of the quarter from a company that you own stock in, um, we'll walk through it. And to make this a little bit more specific, since, um, for example, a factory could be built uh, last year, it could be built five years ago, and depending on how long ago it was built, if we remember our net present value calculations at all, the money is worth different amounts, right? So it matters what year you're looking at. We'll specify that this is the year one of a new factory. Um, so we'll break down the income statement for a company in their first year of operation of a new factory. So what we'll do is we'll plot the expenses as a percentage of the minimum sustainable price, the minimum price necessary to sustain the business long term. And that's denoted by this dashed line right here. First, we'll take a look at all expenses. So let's populate this table here. We see something like this, all right? So we have direct materials here. These are the materials that go into the module, all right? So if I have a little PV module, this one, for instance, this is a miniature one, not, not for sale. It's more for, for demo. It's commemorating the, the founding of uh, Fraunhofer Sustainable Energy Systems. Um, we have aluminum frame. We have some glass. We have some Tedlar backskin here. We have the materials that go in, the, the materials that comprise the module. That's the bulk of the solar PV module, minimum sustainable price. We have labor. Uh, that's 10% here. It's not a tremendous amount. Uh, those who think that... Uh, uh, labor is going overseas, be, or the, the jobs are going overseas because of labor, it doesn't necessarily apply to PV. That's a very small fraction. There are other reasons. We'll get to them later on in the talk. Maintenance, electricity, these are necessary things. Okay, depreciation. This is uh, not the money you owe to the bank. This is the equipment that you bought from the loan from the bank. And now it's sitting in your factory, and it's losing value, just like your car loses value when you buy it, uh, and you drive it around, or use it, or even just sit in the garage. It loses value with time. And you have to, or you should, mark that down on your balance sheet. Uh, finally, you have the sales general administration. Those are the folks doing the selling and the marketing. Uh, R&D, that's important too. Uh, income tax and interest expense. And finally, you're left with a very, very narrow profit margin ratio. And believe it or not, that's enough to sustain a company. So this is an example of a, a healthy uh, breakdown. These are other ways to look at it. You might have heard of the terms cost of goods sold. That's pretty much everything here. Uh, gross margin is the delta, excluding the R&D and sales general administration. And then come variable costs, right? So this is, these are all the expenses. Variable cost is an interesting term. 
because it is the incremental amount of cash needed to produce one more widget, one more module. So if you were to exclude all the things that didn't matter to make one more module and just pay the amount necessary to make one more module, you need labor, you need materials, uh, you need the salespeople to go out and sell it, uh, but you don't need R&D, you don't need to depreciate your equipment necessarily because your equipment's already there, and you're left with what's called variable costs. Now, if the selling price falls below this value right here, technically the company should shut its doors. So the selling price could be a little bit higher than this, and the company is still getting cash. But in the quarterly report, these numbers look really negative, right? Because when you add up all of this and you compare it to your selling price, the company on paper is losing money, even though it is generating cash. The reason I'm explaining all of this is because it is awfully hard to understand what exactly is going on in the solar industry right now that margins are being compressed. This helps explain some of that. Right now, there are a lot of companies where the selling price is kind of right around here. It's above their variable costs, but barely. Uh, but it's below their all expenses in, and so they're bleeding money on paper. And certainly no bank would give them an additional loan if they were market driven, uh, because they're not able to, to pay off uh, all their expenses on paper. But they're still able to keep themselves solvent. Um, if, the, uh, if the selling price drops below this value here for that particular company, they go out of business or uh, begin losing money, uh, bleeding cash, or uh, put a halt to their factory. So let's take this construct here. Now that we understand cost, the amount of money that a company would need to create a product, and price, the amount the customer is willing to pay for it, let's take that and project that onto crystal and silicon solar cell technology today, onto the technology which comprises about 85% of all modules produced today. What we see when we do a sensitivity analysis on all of the different components, the, 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 the price components that comprise the module, is the following chart right here. Let's break this down. We have module price sensitivity on the vertical axis. What this means is if we change any one of these variables by 1%, what percent change of module price results? You can see that variables higher up here are ones that have a bigger impact on module cost, or in this case, module price. And in particular, conversion efficiency, the efficiency by which the module converts sunlight into electricity. If the efficiency increases by 1% relative and all the other costs stay the same, then the module price goes down by 1% relative, right? So your efficiency is a huge lever on, uh, on, on the module selling price. And here's why, or the minimum module uh, sustainable selling price. Here's why. Every cost that scales with area scales with efficiency. If this solar cell is now twice as efficient, that means I needed half the amount of materials per watt per unit power produced by this module to make uh, the product. Right? So now uh, the area, all of the materials, the labor necessary to install this on the roof, the racking materials, a few other components that aren't even shown here are dependent on the module efficiency. So efficiency, huge lever. And that's why unless a technology reaches, say, a 10% or a 12% benchmark, most investors don't take it very seriously. Capital cost. So this is the, uh, the cost of, of uh, capital equipment. Um, this is the depreciation expense. Silicon feedstock, this is the material that comprises the actual wafer itself. So in this case, the wafer looks a little bit black. That's a silicon wafer in there. It's about four times the thickness of your hair, 200 microns. Doesn't sound like very much, but it adds up a significant cost to the total uh, module. And yield is an interesting one. Yield has a very, there's a very high sensitivity of yield to price. And the reason is if the yield goes down, um, especially if a wafer breaks toward the end of the process, you're losing all of that investment in that wafer that you can no longer capture, you can no longer sell to your customer. In essence, your profit margin is sitting shattered there on the floor of the factory. But yields are already very, very high in most commercial factories. And that's why the maximum price savings, this x-axis that I've largely ignored until now, shows you the maximum amount of price you, or maximum savings you can get if you were to take any one of these variables and drive it towards its theoretical optimum. Right? So if your yield went to 100%, how much more could you possibly save? Well, not a whole lot. You're already at 95. But efficiency, we're pretty far from the theoretical efficiency limit in commercial production. So we have a long way to go. I'm setting the stage to describe how the technology is evolving as we move forward in time. Our standard technology today, like the little solar cell I just showed you, is a module that has about a 14.8% conversion efficiency, a solar cell device 
that is screen printed with silver and aluminum paste, and the wafer is fabricated using a wire sawing process, and it's around 200 microns thick. Where is the technology headed? Where are uh, innovators uh, at MIT and other places uh, trying to make their impact to reduce manufacturing uh, cost and the minimum sustainable price of the modules? Well, as we just reviewed, module efficiency needs to go up. So folks are targeting something in the range of 20.5% as their target efficiency of the module. The solar cell device, uh, in, in response to that need of achieving the high efficiency, some improvements have to be made, and we have to get rid of silver. Does anybody have uh, an intuition of what percentage of world silver currently goes into crystalline silicon solar cell devices? 5%. 5%. It's higher now. It's uh, 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 approaching 10%. Right, so this is 10% uh, of the world's silver currently being used to make the metallization uh, of these crystalline silicon solar cells that are going out into the world. Definitely not sustainable long term. Um, so we need to find some replacement materials for that. Um, wafer, uh, less silicon, a lot less silicon, more than 5x less silicon. So wafers on the thickness of your hair without the sawdust, we'll get to that. And integrated manufacturing, a lot more streamlined than what we have today. Um, it's interesting to note that this is our uh, advanced concept scenario as published in this article right here, and similar conclusions are being reached by a variety of other road mapping efforts, um, industrial consortia, uh, national labs, and so forth. And then finally, there's the breakthrough concepts. The idea is to achieve module efficiencies beyond the theoretical limit, around 35%. Uh, this requires not only high, high efficiencies, but also advanced light management. And nobody really knows what these technologies will, might look like. Uh, uh, we hear the term uh, black swan coined by Vinod Kosla as, as one example. Um, we are, are unclear at the moment. I have some ideas. Other folks do too. But uh, we'll, see, we'll see where that goes. What is clear, though, is that if we can realize the advanced concept in the breakthrough technology, our costs can come down considerably. So here, this column chart represents the manufacturing cost, and the black dot up here with the error bars represents the minimum sustainable price for the current technology today, an advanced technology uh, in the near future, and uh, a breakthrough technology well into the future. And what we see here is as we cross this threshold of 50 cents per watt, minimum sustainable price, we're reaching in the southwest of the United States electricity prices on the order of 6 cents per kilowatt hour. That's really, really interesting uh, from a, a large commercial perspective. Essentially, at this point, we can envision large-scale PV adoption in the absence of subsidies, which is truly exciting. And one of the interesting messages here is that crystal and silicon technology, among others, is capable, at least on paper, of reaching these sorts of minimum sustainable prices. Um, and uh, there's a lot of innovation that needs to be done, though, to get to that point. Uh, these breakthrough technologies, um, even more. So let's take a step back and look at this uh, technology that currently comprises 85% of the market today. Let's take a look at this right here and understand, given its manufacturing process, just how much there is to optimize and innovate. Right? It's a really interesting material, silicon. The more you get to work with it, the more you, you're really truly fascinated by it. And so I'll give you a, a short little tangent just to put everything in perspective. Right? So, we're working with this material that did not originate here on Earth, obviously. It's a product of a star, and uh, actually a big star um, that lasts probably for a few hundreds of millions of years. And it's only within the last few months of its life that it produces copious amounts of, the, of this element silicon. Right? It then goes nova. Um, it spews these uh, elements throughout the universe. They accrete, form a planet, form the foundation upon which we stand. We mine it up from the ground, reduce back to its elemental state, and then point it back to our local star. It's really quite a, a fascinating little, <laughs> little cycle there. So um, we, have, uh, we start out with this, this mined material, and we refine it into a very, very pure state, a distillation process. Uh, in principle, similar to how alcohol is refined. We uh, then take that gas, uh, crack the gas onto little rods, these rods shown right here in the middle, and they grow very, very big, wide in diameter. And these are some of the purest materials known to humankind. We then melt those very pure materials in a very impure environment, an industrial environment, forming ingots like this. Um, and then those ingots are sliced into individual bricks or columns. And those columns are then sawn. You can see the columns right here, sawn using a wire that's moving around five meters per second. Um, this is one continuous wire, kilometers long, 
uh, grinding through those uh, bricks and creating individual wafers. And during the sawing process, about half of the silicon is lost. Maybe about a third of the silicon is lost. So what is the goal here? The goal I mentioned, we, we have to reduce our silicon utilization by about 5x. One process or one uh, idea that has been uh, imagined by engineers and scientists and is now being reduced to practice by several companies is to start with the silicon-based gas, the silane gas, from the distillation process that I mentioned, to go directly to deposition on a seed. Um, so the seed is formed with a single crystalline layer um, with a little buffer, and then the epi layer is grown from this gas directly on that seed. The seed is removed and the single crystalline uh, uh, substrate is then reused uh, for another process. And we have this very, very thin layer of silicon grown without any uh, sawdust, without any kerf loss, and that forms our wafer. So that's one approach um, that's usually called the epi approach. There is another approach to uh, go all the way to the solid silicon form, melt it down, and then form the wafer directly from the melt. And there are companies developing this method as well. A third is to go to the brick stage, and then use some technique, either iron implantation or uh, straight cleaving using a mechanical uh, lever formed a variety of cleaved wafers, and then again, you have a wafer. So all of these involve no sawdust. They're all technologies that are called kerfless and have the potential to reduce silicon utilization. And I highlight this because there are multiple redundant approaches. That means that there's healthy competition and there's uh, a nice chance uh, for a real breakthrough. And several of the innovators uh, that are in commercial, or are, 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 say in, in startup company phase, include these. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, this is just a, a, a taste. And you can get a sense of how many are located here in uh, the Bay Area, Crystal Solar for instance, uh, and several others, Twin Creeks. We'll move from wafer fab into cell fab. We mentioned that producing thinner wafers using less uh, silicon is only part of the equation. We also need to improve efficiencies. And what I wanted to emphasize with this plot right here is to show the multiplicity of different paths you can use to get to a silicon wafer. Now, all, each of these paths produces a slightly different silicon wafer, right? And the reason no one technology is, is currently in, in large-scale commercial production yet is because different companies are all very promising, they're all very promising, but all overcoming uh, unique challenges uh, in the road to uh, mass manufacturing. And as a result, oopsie, as a result, uh, the starting product that enters the cell fabrication line looks different depending on what company it's coming from. And the way we process that material into a working solar cell has to be different as well. It's akin to the following scenario. If I arrived home and, uh, and we were gonna cook together and you gave me the ingredients list, I had to go to the supermarket and get certain types of ingredients for you to cook your favorite dish, and you expected a certain set of ingredients, so you began prepping your oven, getting everything just right, and I showed up and I had another set of ingredients. I said, well, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll use the same recipe, we'll use the same oven time temperature profile. We should get the same result out, right? No, wrong. Um, it's the same with solar cells. If you attempt to use the same recipe to manufacture your solar cell device, it doesn't always work as you expect. Sometimes it does, oftentimes it doesn't. And the reason is there are multiple processing steps during solar cell fabrication, some of which are listed here, and they interact with each other in a nonlinear way. So one of the uh, reasons that each material is unique is because each material can have different defect structure. And what I mean by defects are structural defects like grain boundaries and dislocations, flashback to material science class, and impurities. Impurities are present in solar cells in very, very small concentrations, sometimes parts per trillion, parts per billion. And you might think, why do I care about such dilute concentrations? Parts per billion, that's, that's very, very small. Well, let's put this in perspective. Here is a cluster of around 10,000 silicon atoms. And here, or there, is one impurity atom. So we have one part per 10,000 impurity concentration here. That sounds like a very dilute concentration, one part per 10,000. But when we begin to look at the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that we care about, we're looking at part, hundreds of parts per million. Arsenic in the drinking water, we're looking at somewhere between 10 and 50 parts per billion as being uh, defined as legal limit over the past few years. And other examples of dilute concentrations of some impurity, if you will, affecting the equilibrium of a larger system. Inside of a, a silicon-based solar cell device, it is very little different. Metals can begin affecting the performance of solar cells in very, very minute concentrations. So we want to dive into the solar cell device and understand how these 
performance limiting defects are distributed. And to do that, we embark on a multi-scale uh, adventure uh, comprising many characterization techniques, some of which are shown here. On the left-hand side, we have size scales that we're familiar with. Uh, on the right-hand side here, well, technically, this should end with one nanometer. Uh, to put that in perspective, a nanometer is the distance your hair grows between when you pick up your razor and apply it to your body. That's a very, very small distance. But um, it's, uh, it's nevertheless uh, uh, something that can affect solar cell performance. And so going from macroscopic down to here requires stringing together many characterization tools. These are electrical tools using a laser to, to raster over the solar cell device, a real macroscopic solar cell device, and measure the current output at each spot the laser strikes. So you're measuring a map of the electrical performance on the device. We call it electrical transport properties. This is a structure. As you zoom in, you can etch the material to reveal certain defect structures. Here you can see these uh, defects, these dark spots, dislocations, correspond to regions of lower performance. And as you zoom into an individual dislocation, you can see metals surrounding that dislocation core, Cottrell clouds, if you will. And this is a synchrotron-based uh, nano X-ray fluorescence tool that has a spot size of around 40 nanometers, which is around 1,000 times thinner than the diameter of your hair. And it is truly fascinating to think about that tiny, tiny spot rastering over the sample in a controlled fashion such that one line matches up to the next. That's <laughs> truly a feat of engineering. We can do even better. We can create a small little tip of our sample, small little tip, and one atom at a time run it through a mass spec onto a two-dimension position analyzer and obtain a map, a 3D map of reconstruction of the distribution of atoms within the sample. Um, this is not our work over here. It's by uh, another uh, uh, colleague. But uh, it shows you the distribution of certain types of impurities within a material. And this really allows you to go from macroscopic materials all the way down to the specific defects that are limiting performance. So we can experimentally validate the models I'm about to describe. Right, so I told you about the time temperature profile, your oven, if you will, that you use to process your solar cell device. Silicon is like a rock, and to get it to do anything, you really need to either use some powerful chemicals or high temperatures to move atoms around inside. So to grow the material, we melt it at around 1400 degrees C and then cool it to room temperature and wind up with a wafer. Uh, this is the cross section of the wafer right here, and it happens to be a P-type wafer. As we continue with our solar cell processing, we first form the junction, the PN junction inside of the device by diffusing in phosphorus. And for the non-initiated here in the group, what this means is we're creating a built-in field that can separate charge. If we just had this bare wafer, light came in and excited an electron hole pair, they would dance around in a random walk. There would be no potential, no voltage, no uh, buildup of charge. Whereas now we have this built-in electrical field, you can separate the charge that's generated by the sunlight. Very critical step, this junction formation step. Next, we have the formation of uh, uh, an anti-reflection coating that allows it to absorb light. And that's why silicon, which is normally gray, appears black right here. And we have the contact metallization that allows you to extract charge and utilize 10% of the world's silver uh, in the process, uh, which is right here, the firing step to uh, create these contacts. So if we look at the time temperature profile in schematic form, this right here is really the one process with the largest thermal budget, the largest amount of heat right, that we can use to manipulate the defects inside of the material. And just like sugar inside of your coffee has a higher solid solubility when the temperature is higher, and as the coffee begins to cool, the, the, the sugar begins to precipitate out in crystalline form. A similar effect happens here where the metals dissolved or precipitated out inside of the material begin dissolving as you heat your wafer up. And so to understand that in a bit better, uh, in, in a better form, we take the cross section of our device and now we're populating it with precipitates of iron and point defects, little black dots, individual iron atoms moving around the lattice, so-called iron interstitials. And as we heat up the sample to do this phosphorus diffusion step, these precipitates begin dissolving. The solubility for iron increases within the bulk. As we begin annealing, uh, the phosphorus diffuses into the wafer, forming that junction region. It actually has a higher solid solubility for the iron. The iron begins being attracted to that layer. And as we cool down back to room temperature, the solubility drops again. And the segregation coefficient increases, and we have a, a depletion of iron point defects within the bulk, an increase of their concentration up here in that layer. We're sweeping the iron out of the device. And depending on how we cool, we get a different final distribution of the iron, which is nice. We can control the iron distribution. But it's not so nice, because now, depending on what type of input material I have or what type of time temperature profile I use, I'm going to get a different material coming out of it. 
I'm going to get a different solar cell performance coming out, and I'm not going to be able to know what is optimal for my device. So what is the solution for that? The solution is to simulate it, to model it. If we know all the physics involved that can describe the kinetics and thermodynamics of the reactions inside of the solar cell device, we stand a chance of being able to predict how the material will respond to solar cell processing. That is the point at which the engineer, I believe, reaches a pinnacle of existence, when the engineer knows the process well enough that she can control it. That is truly the, 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 art, the, 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 the pinnacle of success as an engineer. So we start knowing the distribution of the defects inside of our device using that synchrotron tool that I mentioned. We also can measure the total concentration of the defects inside of the material using bulk uh, analyses. And we input the time temperature profile, the temperature recipe, if you will, for processing the solar cell. And this we call the impurities component of our simulation or our model. We use a partial differential equation solver to describe the diffusion of phosphorus into the wafer, forming the junction that separates charge. We can describe the diffusion of iron as well using simple fixed law, uh, the segregation of iron into that phosphorus rich layer, and the precipitate dissolution and growth. As we know, uh, the precipitates will dissolve at higher temperatures and then grow as you begin cooling back down. We can solve this using MATLAB. We can determine, based on this PDE solver, what the final distribution of the defects will be throughout the thickness of the wafer. And from that, we can determine the electrical performance of the solar cell. And that we call our two components, so impurities two, and finally efficiency. Uh, knowing the electrical performance of the material, we can predict the device efficiency. And that's uh, the uh, conclusion of our simulation. So you can see it comprises several discrete steps. First, analytical knowledge of what the material is like. What is your input condition? The uh, process itself coupled uh, with the physics underlying it. And finally, the efficiency at the end. And I want you to feel some sense of understanding of, of, of this beyond just a simple uh, you know, hand wavy explanation here. I'm going to rekindle that inner engineer in, in the audience here. Um, this is the uh, diffusion of phosphorus as a function of time. This right here is the concentration of the interstitial as a function of time right here as well. And this is simple uh, you know, fixed law. We can understand that pretty straightforward. But there's a segregation term as well that's added here that pulls the iron out of the solar cell device. We also have the dissolution of the precipitates using Ham's law and uh, the segregation term uh, with a, a bunch of fitting parameters, which is uh, the simplest way to uh, make sure that the experiment is, is real. You validate it using, uh, you validate your, your theory using the experiment and the evolution of the precipitates, which is just the flip side of, of this, uh, the evolution of point defects. So uh, enough for equations, but it just, uh, the conclusion is that you have a few fit parameters. The empirical model captures much of the complex physics and avoids uh, hundreds of fitting parameters, which you can fit just about anything, especially in a log-log plot. Um, and it's fast. Uh, we, the simulation time is about one minute per condition. So a student can set up 1,000 conditions, go home, come back in the morning, and collect the data. And uh, it's proven. We've now developed several processes with industrial partners, which is kind of cool. Now, I wanted to highlight the history of the evolution of this. Uh, this simple uh, model here didn't evolve in a vacuum. As a matter of fact, we stood on several sets of shoulders. And the reason I'm plotting through the next few slides is to illustrate the development process of a, uh, a new technology or a new tool in, in industry. Back in 1999, a group in Duke, uh, Plecano Ventan, uh, described for the first time some high temperature steps to dissolve precipitates and then different cooling profiles to gather them. Um, these were uh, simple models, but uh, nevertheless uh, very powerful and uh, well ahead of their time. They got laughed out of the room because nobody believed that there were that high metal concentrations inside of solar cells. They said, well, integrated circuits have metal concentrations around 10 to the 10 atoms per cubic centimeter. How can you be modeling 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15? That's five orders of magnitude more than integrated circuit chips can have. No way are you modeling anything remotely representative of the real world. Well, in fact, they were right. But it took a few years for folks to really catch on. And by that point, Plekhanov had moved on. He was a uh, scientist in the group at the time. And uh, interest was, was, uh, was lost to some degree in the simulation. A group at Berkeley developed a, uh, a simple gathering simulation in Excel. Instead of using a, a powerful computer like Plekhanov and Tan, uh, they were developing it using Excel. 
And in parallel, a group in Spain as well developed a very simple uh, uh, calculation code for predicting the behavior of iron inside of solar cell materials, early days. This Excel model was then translated into a MATLAB code around 2004. That MATLAB code was then taken to Finland when Hele Vainula uh, is now a professor over there. She was a student in Berkeley, now a professor in Finland, developed it even further with her progeny. And Fraunhofer Ise, uh, who acquired Weber as their director, um, worked with Hele Vainula to develop another code that was uh, coming to publication in 2011. Meanwhile, in our group at MIT, uh, I graduated from Ike Weber's group in Berkeley, so I was well aware of the code development in Berkeley, and we hired a postdoc from the group in Spain, merged the two, and formed this I2E code, and we collaborate with the group in Fraunhofer Ise. So this did not grow up out of a vacuum. In fact, there was a lot of input and a lot of exchange that occurred during this, and this is why you need a vibrant scientific community with a sustained investment over several years, and a few people who are willing to take risks and stick their necks out for new ideas. Out of this came uh, new guidelines for optimizing solar cell materials. Uh, if you have monocrystal and silicon, for instance, instead of using standard process, you can go for a shorter process but at a higher temperature. And we've proven that this works out with several industrial partners. This is a rather complicated graph. But what you're looking at is a process development history uh, as shown by simulation, not the actual experimental results. Uh, those are proprietary, but the, uh, the, the simulations that we performed are not. Um, the original process was up here. The shortened process, just guided by intuition alone, dropped the performance of the material. The minority care lifetime decreased below the performance target, so it was not viable for commercial application. But the process was much shorter. We continued working, uh, optimizing the, uh, the simulation code until finally we were able to further shorten the process time while improving the electrical performance of the material and resulted in a process that meets the performance targets and is less than half of the initial process time. And this allowed a company to take a new product to market. We're very proud of that. So it's an exciting uh, application of a project that started as, as a DOE-funded uh, research uh, and eventually worked its way into industry. Likewise, if you have another input material, so-called multicrystalline silicon, your process might look a little different. You might, instead of using a high temperature short process, you might use a longer time step at higher temperatures to dissolve precipitates and then cool down more slowly to room temperature to manage precipitate uh, or to manage the collection of impurity point defects. And even though you've increased your total cycle time, the efficiency improvement more than pays for itself. So that's where the cost model comes in handy, because now we can figure out, aha, we double our process time. What percentage improvement of efficiency do we need to achieve to overcome the additional cost of added process time? We can begin quantifying that now. And what we see, just as an example, if you start with a pretty heavily contaminated material, this is the as-grown case. This is the minority carrier lifetime showing you the electrical performance of the material. As you try a standard process, we'll call it 820 degrees C, you improve the material a bit. You can see the scale bar has changed now, about a factor of eight improvement. But as you go to higher temperatures, as predicted by the model, um, you get an even further improvement as you're dissolving these impurity clusters within the material. And the cool down has to be tailored just right to be able to get those uh, dissolved impurities out of your material. I'll breeze through the following slides, which are just experimental validation. Um, but I'll uh, jump to this, which is an industrial application of some of the earliest work uh, within a, a multicrystalline silicon ingot. Um, unfortunately, the company that did the work with us is, is no longer uh, here in the United States uh, manufacturing. That's one of the casualties of the recent uh, industry shakeout. Uh, but the principle remains, and it's used in industrially uh, in, in other companies. What's shown here is the standard process in blue. This is minority carrier lifetime, the, uh, quality of the, uh, the electrical quality of the material. And the optimized process, uh, shown in red here. And what you see is not only an improvement across the vast majority of the ingot, this is the ingot height, but you also recover material that you would otherwise throw away. That material at the very bottom of the ingot used to be so contaminated you could just chuck it. Now, on the other hand, if you process it correctly, you can recover it, and you get almost a, a few percent yield boost in uh, the process, and that translates directly into the bottom line. So you might say, OK, I have this simulation code. I have to input the initial impurity concentration and distribution. I input the, the, the recipe that I'm using. I input my device architecture, and I get out my efficiency. OK, that's very nice, but it still doesn't help me solve the real problem. The real problem is this. I know what efficiency I want. 
Um, I know what cell structure and what metal impurity concentration I have. And now I want you to tell me what process to use. Right? I, have, I have a new material. I, I want to know the process. In other words, I want to solve the, the inverse design problem. And I want to have a truly predictive process development code. How to go about that? Well, you can take all of the equations I showed in the PDE solver and invert them. But that's not very easy since there are some nonlinearities involved. Um, so it would be at best an analytical solution. Or you can run this code in the forward direction and use what's called a genetic algorithm. And the way that works is really, really cool. All right, so picture the following. Picture running this code one way through with a process, a time temperature profile of your choosing. You estimate this should probably be pretty close. So it runs it through. It predicts an efficiency coming out. And then the computer code says, well, let me take your idealized time temperature profile and let me alter it just a little bit. Boom, I've created one mutation. It alters it again. I've created a second mutation, and so on. It creates several children. It runs those through the process, predicts what efficiencies you'll get, takes just the fittest, just the ones that are showing the best performance, mutates those again, sends those through the ringer once more, and the process continues for many generations. So it's called a genetic algorithm because it borrows much of the language from biology, but it's, uh, in fact, a, a very useful tool uh, for solving problems by brute force if you have the, uh, a very fast simulation code in which to do it. And so the genetic algorithm, through successive generations, eventually reached this time temperature profile. Um, what you're seeing here is the lifetime. This is the performance response. This is a heat map. So the darker lines represent better performance, higher lifetimes. And each line represents one mutation or one generation uh, one child at, at, the late, at the latest generation, the last generation to be run. And what you see is the highest lifetimes are ones that have a high temperature throughout and then manage the cool down to promote uh, segregation of the iron uh, to the Gettering layer. In other words, we have a confirmation here from the machine learning approach, this genetic algorithm, that our uh, intuition and our, uh, uh, our, say, our, our, really our intuition is correct. And this is exciting because now, given any input material, you can solve uh, the ideal, the optimized uh, solar cell processing conditions. So the, the simulation tool is available online. Um, it may require a little bit of hand-holding. It's certainly not something with an emergency stop button on it. Um, it's written by an academic group. So if you uh, desire some help, uh, we're happy to help you use it. Um, but it's available free for the world to use. And so far, we've had, uh, I think, around 3,000 uh, user hits um, simulations run. We don't store your data um, unless the program crashes, in which case we, uh, use, we use the data to, to help improve the code. Um, the uh, manufacturing of the PV module, so I'm going to weave back right in here. We discussed minimizing silicon utilization. We talked about improving cell performance. And lastly, manufacturing, reducing the capital equipment necessary to manufacture a solar cell. So I'm going to walk through the last few steps necessary to make this module right here, actually a much bigger one that would go on your rooftop. Um, you have to collect the individual solar cells together, connect them. That's called tabbing and stringing. Then you lay them up and laminate them. In other words, you sandwich them in between the glass, some polymeric encapsulants called ethyl vinyl acetate, EVA, and Tedlar in the back. And finally, you put the frame on the side, this aluminum frame, so that people can handle it without breaking it. And you put the junction box in the back that allows you two little leads, very convenient, uh, positive and negative coming out, that uh, you can use to string up the module uh, to your load or to uh, string other modules together in series. So um, with all of this in mind, we can appreciate how complex the manufacturing process is today and how far the technology of today can improve uh, to, to, to reach uh, cost competitiveness. So a couple of the headlines from the past year as the industry marches forward are, are pretty cataclysmic. PV gross margins fall by 75%. That's, that's pretty substantial. Um, Ooh, China's cylinder economy. What's this about? Well, this is Wall Street Journal saying uh, China has invested a lot in uh, current technology, which might be a little bit outdated. Uh, is it going to be facing its own companies failing? Right now, the production capacity worldwide is around 50 gigawatts. The demand is somewhere in the range of 25 to 30. So there's twice as much production as there is demand right now. Companies are likely going to fail. There is going to be capacity going offline. Um, <laughs> so as these companies begin facing a lot of price pressure, what then? Um, uh, are, how are they handling their, their, their selling prices? What does that mean in a global marketplace? What does that mean in terms of uh, uh, global trade? 
what about the equipment manufacturers, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and what, what are the interrelationships between uh, the, the different countries, right? Is it just about us buying modules from China? Or, or, or do, we, uh, do we invest in certain Chinese companies? What, 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 how should we be uh, orchestrating uh, this the evolution of the global marketplace? And this is really a, a big uh, question right now. I want to posit that domestic PV demand can be met with domestic PV supply. And by domestic, I mean United States domestic. I mean China domestic. I mean virtually any country domestic. The demand should be able to be met with the supply locally, but it needs advanced technology. We can't necessarily do it with today's technology. Uh, the minimum sustainable price differential today is so great between uh, US and, and Chinese manufacturing that it's uh, difficult to compete on the basis of today's technology. But on the basis of an advanced technology, I do see hope. And um, I am not going to go too much into detail during this talk. It's going to be recorded, put out on the web. We have an upcoming publication that we're working on together with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory with Al Goodrich on specifically this topic. Uh, and so as not to steal the thunder from that, uh, I, I won't address it uh, on the video recording, but perhaps at the very end during the Q&A, if we shut the video off, I'm happy to uh, uh, talk a bit more freely. Um, sunny prospects, uh, what this Economist article, which was actually a really nice uh, write-up, um, discussed the uh, US and Chinese um, uh, cost uh, uh, estimates and looked at what the advanced manufacturing scenario could yield. And essentially what it was doing was compiling together a variety of different studies, our own US Department of Energy, uh, Spire Solar, and a few other uh, company reports. And what this is showing is that there, there is a path forward. Right? We uh, don't necessarily have to, or can achieve, we cannot necessarily achieve it with today's tech, but with an advanced technology scenario, similar to the one that I was showing at the very beginning, that middle column, uh, we can get there. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that that's the case. But we can't get there uh, simply by uh, sitting on our hands. We need to, we need to innovate. Let me uh, move on to uh, another few headlines that might have grabbed attention over the past year or two. Um, US called vulnerable to rare earth shortages. Um, China to tighten limits on rare earth exports. Uh, article or, or reports coming out from the American Physical Society from the US Department of Energy on uh, critical materials. Um, these are elements that are utilized in energy systems today, LEDs, solar panels, others, that uh, are not the most abundant stardust uh, that happens to be present on planet Earth. Um, as you might recall, uh, the subsequent fusion reactions that lead to the very heavy elements uh, aren't necessarily the most probable. Uh, and so the uh, probability of finding some of the elements lower on the periodic table uh, drops quite a bit. Um, so we have uh, a limited subset of elements that we can work with that are truly scalable to the terawatts level. And what I'm going to show you is, um, is, is my perspective on, on what's going on. This is the scale of new PV installations worldwide. And these are new energy installations, all energy. What this is showing is that PV is going through a number of phases. There have been uh, some rough patches along the way in the past, um, and, and probably some rough patches in the near future as well. But overall, there is growth. When, in 1987, Ronald Reagan took the solar panels off of the White House roof, uh, this comprised a relatively small fraction, an insignificant fraction of all new energy uh, installation. But now, we're looking at a very meaningful percentage, Comp countries. Countries are beginning to rumble and, and create uh, 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 posturing gestures toward each other, saying, don't take my manufacturing. I want to keep it. Why? Well, because it's finally growing up to be a multi-tens or even low hundreds of billions of dollar industry. So that's quite significant. People want a piece of that uh, for their own uh, taxation revenue. But in addition, um, there's the added uh, notion that this could be a significant technology in the future that we want to have the domestic capacity to produce. If we're going to be installing 20% of our energy base from solar, we want to know how to make it, because we don't want to be reliant, uh, so reliant on uh, another uh, uh, foreign power. So uh, what scale are we talking about here? This is a, um, a, a study from 2010 looking at what would happen if we managed to reach some of the optimistic advanced technology scenarios I presented at the beginning. Well, what would happen if we did, by 2020, reach about 50 cents per watt peak module minimum sustainable price? is that by 2030, the penetration of solar would have reached um, 
a few hundreds of gigawatts here in the United States. So a significant penetration of solar PV throughout the US, and that's a lot of solar panels. Um, to put that in perspective in terms of the elements, this is the global production in 2010 in metric tons per year. This is the price for those same elements in 2010. And these are both very measurable parameters. I I'm not plotting here the total reserves in the Earth's crust, which is a little bit more hokey. You can argue, well, we always find more, like we find more oil. Um, these are, are actual uh, measurable parameters, right? The global production. And what you see, this line right here, <coughs> representing around 40,000 metric tons per year, is for a thin film device utilizing, uh, what was it, a micron or so of material? Micron of material, achieving a moderate solar cell conversion efficiency and sustaining a uh, terawatts level uh, deployment uh, scenario. And uh, this is a, a lot of material. I mean, if you bump up less than an order of magnitude more, you're hitting the mass of the Empire State Building per year. And this is just to replace the modules that are being brought out of service. The elements on the right-hand side are abundant enough to sustain those levels of deployment. Right? We produce these elements in large enough capacity today, all of these guys over here. These elements, not so much. And three of them, marked in red, are currently used in solar cell manufacturing today, tellurium, gallium, and indium. Not to say we should halt production of those panels immediately. No, I, I think we should continue doing research and continue uh, manufacturing them. But someday, maybe as soon as by 2020, we will hit a wall. And uh, the prices will be driven up due to demand. And once the prices surpass this $10,000 per kilogram, uh, they really do begin to impact the bottom line of a solar cell module, uh, effectively amounting to several cents per watt peak. So we can make solar cell materials out of these earth abundant elements. We can replace some of the cadmium tellurides, the copper indium gallium diselenide, the SIGs of the world. Um, and so we can provide a solution. If we work on it today in academia and in research laboratories around the world, we can provide a solution by the time industry needs it. By say 2016, 2020, we can provide a working uh, a solar cell alternative uh, to be seamlessly introduced into the industrial thin film processing chain. There's only one small problem. We talked about efficiency and how important that is. This is the shockley quiser efficiency limit as a function of band gap, or if you like, the optimum color at which the solar cell absorbs light. And we see plotted here silicon and gallium arsenide. Silicon is earth abundant, silver not so much. But we talked about all the technological difficulties in making a cost-effective silicon module. Let's say that this thin film approach is a stopgap measure in case we don't succeed with the crystalline silicon approach. It's a, another uh, uh, a thin film, meaning using significantly less, 100 times less material than the crystalline silicon technology, would already get us a, a large part of the way there in terms of material costs and manufacturing. The big Achilles heel is really the efficiency. Here are the efficiencies of several so-called earth abundant materials. They're way down here compared to the efficiency limit. And so this gap is, uh, is obviously a, a subject of big question. And we have a lot of research going on inside of our group and several groups around the world to close that gap. So let me walk you through the approach that an engineer would take to improving solar cell performance. And this is largely the same path that the people who optimize gallium arsenide, SIGs, CADTEL, other types of solar cell materials took to optimize their systems. And finally, us folks putzing around with the new stuff, we're finally uh, waking up and, and utilizing, adopting a systematic approach toward fabricating better solar cells. This is the cross-sectional view of a solar cell device. Um, this layer right here is only around you know, between one and three microns thick, so it is uh, grossly amplified here. Um, this is the absorber. This is the superstar of the solar cell. It's what absorbs sunlight and generates free charge. These are the surrounding layers within the solar cell device. And just like a good plate of food, the absorber does not survive in isolation. It has to be paired with good partners. Right? And in this case, it has to be paired with a good buffer layer, a good transparent conducting oxide, front metal, back contact metal, and of course, the substrate. Everything has to work together in synchrony. Now, it's easy to create an absorber material that has decent electrical performance. It is much much harder to find the right pairing for that new material that you've just developed, such that you can extract the full potential from it and make a high performance device. And the reason it's difficult is because SIGs, CADTEL, some of these other more established technologies have had decades to figure it out and define the optimum pairings, sometimes by serendipity, other times by intuition. We are starting from a much less privileged position. 
So I'm going to put this device here in the upper right hand side and point to the different regions as I walk through the systematic approach to improving this device. I'm going to be pulling all of this from uh, published data um, showing one particular material system, the one that's furthest along inside of our laboratory. So I'll point to the absorber right here and show you the approach, kind of a systematic approach to improving the material quality. This is always one micron scale bar. You can see that the grain size is improving. In this case, it was temperature that was a modifying agent. Now we're able to deposit grains of around a micron size at room temperature as well um, using some uh, newer technologies. And uh, this has uh, uh, been published as well, showing the evolution of the bulk absorber material. We can achieve good carrier transport properties using a manufacturable approach comparable to single crystal material, which is pretty nice. And this material right here is called cuprous oxide, Cu2O. Uh, you can read more about it inside of this publication. That contact, um, right back here. So marching right along, we have the absorber material. Check, we can knock that one off our list. How do we improve the back contact? For those people working with integrated circuits in the audience, you'll know that creating a good tunneling junction requires manipulating the resistivity of the bulk material. We can achieve that, uh, modifying resistivity over three orders of magnitude, recently published at a solar conference. And with low resistivity material, now we can drop the contact resistance. In other words, the resistance necessary to extract the charge from the material to the point where it no longer impedes device performance. Uh, and this work is, uh, is out for publication any day now. So this shows kind of a systematic approach. Uh, in your mind, you can hear the, 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 the timer going one year, two years, right? You can see the publication dates down here uh, progressing. So achieved record low resistivity, record low contact resistance. Now, uh, this layer up here, the front contact, improving the front contact boosts the device performance quite a bit. Um, these are all in arbitrary units. You can kind of think of these curves as uh, the bigger the curve, the better. Um, and this uh, is a, a so-called high efficiency thin film CU2O-based device. Um, we're not plotting specific numbers on here just yet, um, but uh, that hopefully will be coming out soon. Um, and you can see a systematic approach being taken to improve the device one step after another. Now here's the problem. We have 2011, right? Where was it? Back here. 2011, 2012, 2013, eventually when it's going to be published. And you know, we're, we're inching our way forward. And our sponsors say, OK, that's great work, but we're a little impatient. We want you to move faster. And we want to move faster as well. And here's one of the reasons why we want to move faster. This right here is showing you the uh, necessary reduction in our CO2 intensity of the energy mix to uh, keep CO2 levels in the atmosphere at around 450 ppm. So if we're concerned about climate change, and if we, for a minute, just assume that we want to keep CO2 levels at a, at a stable uh, level, we need to accelerate the rate at which we reduce our CO2 intensity of our energy mix. And to do that, uh, we would need to introduce a, an additional source of low carbon generation energy in an increasing magnitude by 2035, accounting for around 20% of our total energy mix. That's a very aggressive scenario, which means already back here in 2015, we need to start deploying it. It needs to start scaling by 2020 as well. We don't have time to sit around the laboratory, putzing around, making these incremental improvements in our device, uh, and still staying in a few percent. We need to really move faster. And I wanted to emphasize one possible approach that I think has uh, a lot of promise, which is um, a so-called combinatorial deposition. And this is data uh, reproduced by permission from Intermolecular. This is showing the traditional path of improvement of SIGS devices versus time. This vertical line right here is Intermolecular's development process using a combinatorial deposition approach. These little devices, each one of these little uh, metal fingers represents a single device these are various deposition conditions processed on the same wafer using an intelligent deposition system. Right? So th these are all uh, publicly available. Um, and what this has shown here is an improvement from pretty much zero up to 17 uh, and change percent in around nine months with a staff of, I think it was three people. Um, this is what a combinatorial approach, <laughs> some intuition, uh, can get you. So we need to be moving faster. I don't think the way we're going to be conducting research in five years and 10 years is going to look anything like the way we've been doing research for the past 25. I think we're going to be needing to use much, uh, we're going to need to take advantage of faster computers and better experimental tools. The last 
perspective I wanted to share for the night was that big breakthroughs can still happen, but persistence, discipline, and education are needed. Um, persistence, hopefully I've shown you here uh, the reason why persistence is needed. I've shown you a few success stories, but you can ask Craig Hunter, who's here in the audience, who was involved with Intermolecular from the early days, how long it took him uh, to build up this company. It took a while. And these capabilities, they don't grow overnight. The same with some of the innovations happening in our laboratory. Uh, the computer code that I showed you that we now use to help companies develop their solar cell processes that built on a few decades of research. And this perspective here is persistence is needed. Yes, it is a hard time right now, but 99% of the solar panels have yet to be made, right? There is a lot of future ahead of us, and it's up to us to dictate how that will happen. It is clear that there is more than enough sun to satisfy our needs. How are we going to harness it? It is clear that this is not going to be the technology that Alva, my little daughter, will have on her roof when she's an adult. It's up to us to make it. So what is that going to be? Well, we need the discipline to choose the right problems. And that, I think, guided by a cost model and guided by some intuition. So it's not just the affect heuristic, the notion that, oh, it kind of feels good, so I'm going to go with it, but more I've studied the ins and outs of this particular technology. I think I understand uh, the cost structure, and I think I understand the engineering parameters I can uh, directly affect with innovation to drive down that cost, to make it cost competitive. And education uh, are needed. So um, let me uh, highlight one of the interesting areas, uh, potential areas for further uh, innovation. Uh, com combining solar directly with other things, let's say, um, with other, whether it's uh, a storage device or some other medium. Um, this, in this case, an electrochemical cell uh, shown here, for instance, sunlight coming in inside of the solar cell device, splitting, uh, in this case, water, uh, developing uh, oxygen and hydrogen as a result, uh, creating storable fuel directly on the backside of a solar cell device. This is one technology that's uh, being developed today. We're, in fact, collaborating with Dan O'Sara at MIT on this. Um, in this PV silicon device um, was, was the one built in our laboratory. Uh, the catalyst was built in his. And I, I think there is a room for potential breakthroughs, uh, both on the device level, uh, for improving the efficiency, reducing costs, improving manufacturability, but also considering the solar cell device in the context of a larger system. This is just one example. There, there are many. In education, there's certainly a lot more that we can do. The field is growing exponentially. The number of people that I can fit into a classroom is not. Uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming. But um, I had about 18,000 hits on a YouTube version of this talk. That's a lot of people. So if we can harness the, um, if we can harness the web as a means to educate and a means to get out information, I think it can truly have a transformative impact on the way uh, PV develops over the next few years. And we need that because we need more specialists and more generalists, that people who, who just are aware of PV uh, in the world. This is an example of a, a course that we put together at MIT to which Doug alluded. Foundations, these are the foundational principles upon which a solar cell works. The technologies represent crystal and silicon, thin films, et cetera. The themes are cross-cutting themes like how do you design a cost model? to understand the cost structure of your new technology. How, uh, does, how does policy influence the penetration of a technology that is not yet competitive without subsidies, et cetera? These are videos, research videos of our work that are put on the web. So if you visit our website, you can watch a few of them, see what our students are up to. Uh, you can talk to Riley as well. And uh, I think that there is a lot of room still. And so this fall, I'm not teaching the class in person. We're actually working to transition the PV course online with a bunch of deep dives into some technical topics and some general information for the non-specialist. Um, this is uh, one of our educational efforts as well. It's called Solar for Staffers, recognizing the uh, overwhelming abundance of people in DC who go there to learn, not only about policy, but also about the technology that they can influence with their policy. Uh, we've, been out re we've been reaching out to several of these young people and some veteran DC's uh, people as well, uh, teaching them about the fundamentals of photovoltaics. And that's been a real pleasure as well, uh, seeing people genuinely interested in solar learning on both sides of the aisle. And uh, that's definitely an activity that we uh, intend to continue. Uh, this is uh, actually Senator Jeff Bingaman, uh, chair of the uh, Senate uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, visiting our lab uh, and several of his staffers as well, um, learning about solar uh, directly from the source, the students here in the background. And with that perspective, I just wanted to uh, end, conclude the talk, 
and again emphasize that if 99% if of the solar panels have yet to be made, where are we going to make the technology of the future? Are we going to continue investing at home and developing technologies that are truly cost competitive without subsidies, thus able to scale and able to leverage that private capital that has been so elusive uh, to date on the scale necessary to really build large factories? We need it to be cost competitive. We need to, it, to survive, stand on its own legs without subsidies. And for that, we need innovation. We need to drive down the cost of the solar module. And I sincerely hope that I can continue to educate and teach young minds about solar and that we can make that transition. It's a tough one. Uh, we're definitely clinging on with our bloody fingernails right now because the market is quite tough. But I think we can get there. And uh, some predictions are that as, as soon as 2014, this, uh, this oversupply condition, uh, the fact that our production capacity is larger than the supply, uh, should be eased a bit as some of the larger trees in our ecosystem fall down, making space for the younger uh, plants to grow up again. So it's my hope that uh, we maintain the faith uh, and we can make it through this. I think we can. I think we have the technologies available to do it. Uh, but we need to maintain our perspective. And we need to continue clinging on with our fingernails <laughs> as best as we can. And innovate. Don't forget that. So thank you.